right, so if you've watched other ones, I always ask everyone how did we actually meet? Now I don't remember how we met, but I can only assume it was on the gigging circuit. Go to be Thursday night at Baker Street. Number two, aye. That's got a lot to answer for. Aye. Uh, <laughs> aye. Uh, that was myself and Liam, we'd, we'd done that for probably 10 years maybe, 8 years, something like that. Uh, and I just, all I know is that there's lots of photographs and at some point Shawnee just appears in them and then I never got rid of you. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I'm guessing it must have been like Baker Street. Uh, I think we probably would make, because did you know Liam? Uh, aye, I've known Liam years for that? years, aye. Liam's are, you a Denny? are you originally Denny? Aye. And is that how you... Liam, because Liam's a year younger than me. So. Liam was ages with the drummer of my first band, I think, or maybe ah, a year okay. younger. So that was in my first band, the Circle. He, like, when we were, is this was, sort of late nineties, probably? Aye, 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 maybe like ninety-seven, ninety-eight. Right. But uh, Liam, Johnny was still at school. The drummer was still at school. Right, we weren't, okay. we were 18, 19, he was still at school, so... Is, is Whitty the same ages with you? Whitty's a year younger than me. Right. Um, but you would have known him then through the... Like, playing no, the, no the, anything to do with music, no. No? No. I think Whitty was mere later on when it came to uh, music. Right, okay. So see, like, so you're brought up in Denny, so you're a couple years older than me, but you would have been teenager right across the 90s, Britpop, all that sort of stuff. See when you were really wee, what what music were you listening to? Was it how did you get into music? Oh, very very wide. Uh, what as in like did you, did you have parents or grandparents just playing tunes that that were just decent, that good tunes? Is that how you kind of got into it, or or was it kind of when you went to school and you talked to your pals and they say check this out? No, definitely at a young age. So it was before that Aye. until you kind of developed your own taste in music? Aye. I wouldn't say I developed my own taste and started looking properly for things until maybe 13, 14, 15. So you're kind of high school, kind of the same as the rest of us, but Aye. what tunes was it that was playing before that? Was it like the Beatles and all that kind of no, thing? No, even the Beatles. No? Oh, no. I wouldn't say I got properly the Beatles to after the Oasis thing. Right. Uh, I'd obviously heard the Beatles, but I wouldn't say I was... Big on glam rock, aye. To be honest, I with you know probably, aye, glam rock, right? Uh, staples, so there's been glam rock stuff. Could always make having a wee tape, and it had the Slade, T Rex. Is this all like your sort of seventies, early seventies, like seventy one to seventy four, seventy five? Yeah. Uh, a band called Jordi. Which is actually Brian Johnson, Johnson from, from reading his was, book. The, was the singer reading his book Jordy. and they, I think they were seeing a little bit of success before he then became all the well the one big hit. I can always I also mind like would have been like first second year at high school, and we used to, I used to go to my I had a cousin who's no longer with us unfortunately, but I had my cousin I used to go to his for my lunch. Right. Because it was closer to the school, mm -hmm. and his ma, ma auntie always had on either a Bee Gees greatest hits, a Diana Ross greatest hits, or the Grease greatest hits. So it's all melody. Aye, all melody. It's funny though, you didn't see. It's not until you look back, right, that you realise how much all this stuff influences you later on. But see, for me, pop, pop music, and I'm not talking pop music as in like. Step. Pop music back then isn't it what pop music is new or it even was in the nineties. But anyhow, but for a good pop tune, you, it's all melody. Three minutes melody. It's got to be something that's Aye. just catchy, and it's you've only got three four minutes to impress. I think I know. Uh, I mean, you know, you know me anyway. I, I love my eighties stuff, mm -hmm. and I think that well, pop music in the eighties is very different to what's out now. For example. Aye. Or even in the, anything in the last 20 years. Like the 80s was just a decade unto its own. It was just like, <laughs> it's never sounded like that again. But then you could say the same about the 90s. It was the development of uh, the equipment and that and all. Yeah. And the 80s. Was you like 60s? 
was different from the 70s, which was different from the 80s, which was different from the 90s. I kind of feel like after that, I don't know, maybe technology got to a certain point that you're not really improving, but I don't feel like anything's changed much in the last 20 years. But see for the 40 years before that. Ah, uh, there's, there's a reason. There's a reason why when we're out gigging, you still play the most popular songs that are from those 40 years. I had this, I had this uh, conversation the other night uh, with something I... I mean, you could go on about it forever, but I mean... The there's no the, much the for the last 20 years you can pick that was going to get a room. Aye, and I've said this a, a, a few times, it's like, like, see if you've got a new song that comes out now, it's got a shelf life, maybe six months, maybe, maybe a year that you play it and it gets a good reaction and then it disappears. But you play a song from the 60s, 70s, 80s or 90s, you can still be playing that, you'll still be playing it in 20 years time, it'll still be getting a reaction. But I think there's a lot, maybe, I don't know if that's a nostalgia thing as well, maybe. I think it's nostalgia, but I also think, I know, especially the 80s and still the 90s to an extent, things like Top of the Pops were massive. Mm -hmm. So it was before, or just at the start of satellite TV. So back in the 80s, you only had your three, then four channels or something. So like Pop, uh, Pop, Top of the Pops was getting like 15 million viewers mm -hmm. every Thursday night. That could, that would break a hit. But the other thing you've got as well though, is uh, music so accessible now, but See, like back in the day, right? You'd go and you'd be, you'd save up, you'd get the album that you're that's came out that you're wanting to get, and you'd play it over and over and over, and you'd study the wee booklet that came with it, and you you just Aye. you were so focused on from the very start to the very end, whereas the attention span now is like you 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 don't even need to download stuff. You have got like YouTube, you've got Spotify, you, you know, but it can be like thirty seconds, and I'm bored. Next one, I'm bored. Next one. Whereas I think our generation was maybe the last generation of actually properly focusing. I know, I totally because, agree. Because it wasn't, all music wasn't accessible, so you just focused on what you had at the time, or your pal would come down and they'd get, you'd make a copy of whatever it was they were listening to, and you didn't have anything else to listen to, so you focused on that cassette tape or whatever it was, and I, I, it's a weird one, like, like I don't know. Well, what happened as well, and it, don't get me wrong, because the streaming's got its... Pro, uh, pros and cons, of but for us it's like up until the mid nineties you were still looking for maybe a new release coming out. And but when what happened with the internet and then the streaming platforms and was it Napster before? Yeah, yeah, Spotify? that was kind of two thousands. So thing. so uh, what you got with that was I could then get for example an album or a hit by like the Zombies mm -hmm. for the late sixties. Which was at that point new music to me. Yeah. But it's no. It was like thirty year old at that time. Mm. But it was new music to me. So you didn't have this urge or that to uh, like looking yeah. for the new But here's stuff. another thing and people will argue different points, but I always kinda think, see kinda two thousand onwards. When I look at music, like there's there's still lots of great music coming out the now. But I kind of feel like, by that point, everything had kind of been done. As in like, seeing like the 60s, there were like, creating music that had never been heard before. Same with the 70s, even with the 80s, even with the 90s to a degree, I kind of feel like by the, by the time you got to 2000, everything has been done. So there's still plenty of good stuff coming out, but you could argue and go, that's just a rehash of but then you could say that about the 90s. And you it was said about the 90s in terms of, well, like Oasis and that. What I, what I thought I, Oasis uh, influenced the Beatles. <laughs> but what I, uh, what, I think about, what I think about that, from that point of view, is I think the last time I'd heard it, something like 150,000 new tracks are uploaded to Spotify every day. And I, mean, I think there's something new coming out. It doesn't matter how good it is, it's getting it gets lost, lost in it's the sea of songs. But on the flip side, you, you, you're living in Denny. You can sit in your bedroom, record something, there's a chance somebody in America or Australia could hear your song, whereas when we were, uh, there's no chance that anybody outside your street would probably hear it, uh, anything. So there's, there's good and, and bad things. But see, like, so obviously you've been into music, same as the rest of us, just kind of grown up. 
how did you get into guitar? What made you go, I want to, I want a guitar, I want to learn to play the guitar? I didn't. Didn't I, no, I was all. Or did you play I, anything I, before the I guitar? Ended up, I was writing. I was singing and writing songs. So did you like, just, did you start singing first before playing aye. the guitar? Aye. Right. So here here's one that, that, that I've not really asked many people because it's so guitar focused, right? But how did you get into singing then? Because see me personally, like you you know myself, I only started solo gigging a couple of years ago. And uh, see the nerves of singing was a lot more nervous for me than playing the guitar. I know I can play the guitar. I might be good, I might be bad, but I know what I'm capable of doing with the guitar. But singing's a whole other game because a lot of it is confidence. And yes, you do need to be able to to have some ability to a degree, but a lot of it's just pure confidence. You can get away with so much. But how did... Like, see when you were, so you, did you start, like, joining bands, were you just singing originally? I was singing for about six years old, so... And was to, that just something that like you just enjoyed doing it? See, going back, I was at, before I moved to Derry, I moved to Derry in maybe primary five, but before that, I actually just didn't, uh, came on. Right. That's where my grandparents, and, from. grandparents and that were for. So mm. I was there, I was at Carmier's primary there for the first, up to primary five. Mm -hmm. There was a head teacher there, and the head teacher was on the piano, and I don't know if it was just part of the curriculum or he just done it off his, off his end back, but he would pull. Uh, he, we would be we would be ten and we, we were in choirs. So I was in like choirs oh, for right, okay. primary two, right. and what we used to do was we'd go like we would compete, we'd go around and compete against other schools now. But it would also, if you were in that choir, mm -hmm. you got the afternoon of school because you'd go and like sing at like the old folk songs and all that. Right, okay. So, I think 100% confidence wise. So you already built your confidence up from a young age, which is probably the best thing that could happen. Aye. Um, because, because when I think back to my primary school, we didn't even have a music teacher, we didn't have music lessons. I think we maybe had one one or two across the seven years I was at primary, but, I th but there was music was just non-existent. I think, I, I think, I mean, I don't know for sure, but I think it's just this head teacher happened to be uh, musical. So it was that thing that you're doing that, so I'm, I'm guessing from there you get your confidence of, of actually singing in front of people. Aye. And then obviously that progresses on into being a teenager. Is that when you kind of started, did you start your first band, did you join a band that already existed? How did you kind of get into the music scene when you were a I teenager? Started, started the band. So was it just simply, I'm a singer, I want to start a band, who do I know? How, how did you go about starting your own band? Because it's very different back in the 90s to to now. I, I think I had a click moment when I was maybe about 15, but I was, write, I was writing songs, we were writing lyrics and melodies for and how, how primary did, six, primary seven. How did you remember them, or was it simply if it's a good song I'll remember it, if it's a bad song I won't? Like see if you're like. <sighs> I don't, aye, probably. I mean, I wouldn't really know at that age, but mm -hmm. it was just I could do. I'd hear like a cheap keyboard, so I could play mel. Oh, right, so play like melodies. Out. I would couldn't play chords or anything. But you would figure out the melody. That sounds good. That doesn't sound good. I'll do more of that. I'll do less of that. But aye, but I think what that gave me was it, no. By the time I got to 15, 16 years old, I'd had a couple of years of kind of doing that just for my own pleasure. That it kind of knocked a lot of the shite out of the way. Uh -huh. if you know what I mean? I'd done, I had been doing it for a couple of years. Yeah, it's, like it's, cheesy. it's always trial and error. Uh -huh. and, and I'll continue on like that, but I know what you're meaning. But like, 15, 16 year old. You think back to the first song you wrote, it's probably embarrassing if there was a recorder here that you could actually sit and play it. Aye. You'd be like, what was I thinking? But I think everybody probably does that to start with. The 15, 16 year old I would say would have been... And was it the Brit pop thing that, aye, that kind of you were just like, I mean, what an age to be at if that was what you were into. Aye, no, definitely. But was it just like, was Oasis the big band for you? Or Stereophonics or all of them? No, Stereophonics were never... I didn't, I didn't really consider the Stereophonics as Brit pop. They were a wee, 
So who, like who, the, who, was it Oasis, the, the big one? See, to be honest with you, aye, Oasis, Oasis was when it really clicked in, I would say. But I used to, I listened to, I listened to the radio, I used to love listening to singers talking about writing songs. So I used to listen to like the radio and I think it was 4th FM at the time. And I think, aye, it would have been... Oasis was a, was like the wah moment when that because it is also cool that they were discovered in Glasgow so it's just down the road ah uh, you know and then you maybe a wee bit later on you've got like Travis who are from Scotland you know it's like there's you can relate ah uh, no definitely it's not like it's this untouchable band from America that that you're like that's great but you can't relate to them in any way because they're from the other side of the world even like Ash. See, yeah, because yeah. Ash was so young and like near or less the same right. age, uh, so I, I you couldn't were, stand that band. You know, kind of really like that. <laughs> I, I had to. But it was. I mean, they were girl from Mars. I think they would have been sixteen, seventeen, or something uh, silly like that when that when they came out. But uh, no, but I back then. But I, I would have said Oasis probably. But Oasis wasn't really. I mean, Oasis is a complete love or hate debate with them with them loads of folk but there's no doubt and for me I mean I don't know I haven't I don't, I don't really listened much, to much of them after like the third album but back then though it, it was, co- it it was, was cultural it was it age was inspiring it. to Aye. to to see because it was a movement and it was one of those things I, I heard Noel Gallagher saying in an interview once that there was just there was this small period of time where they, quite, they hadn't quite reached the huge success that they got, but there was this small period where they were just, their set list was just, it was all just like instant hits, but they were also the same age as the audience, and they could they were writing about stuff that the audience could relate to. Before, regular before, working before all the money guy. started to pour in, and it was just like, you know, he says for a small, like maybe for a year, he says it was just this golden period of just it being amazing and then it becomes a business and there's all the money and there's all the cool stuff that happens with that but it's different from when you're first starting out but there's lots of bands just wanted that kind of the, the same sort of success in that. Uh, but so did you you started your own band how did you go about getting musicians uh, or was it just pals from school that you knew already playing aye, the guitar, drums, things player, like that? Aye. The two, the two bands, my, I have been in like three, but my two main bands that I've been in, <coughs> I taught the bass players how to play, which is really ironic because I can't even really play the bass myself. But right. the yeah. thing that the Oasis thing gave us was the bass player in the Oasis only played the root notes. Because they had a lead but, guitarist and a rhythm guitarist. But the thing, it's funny though because around the same time, like I would have been, you know, mid nineties, I was listening to your really your hard rock, heavy metal, all that sort of stuff. And it's n- now when you look back, so much of that is guitar based, as in it's it's a guitar riff. Ah, yeah. The, the whole song, the whole song was based around two or three guitar riffs that are all put together. And that's that was kind of that set up. Oasis was very much, you know, they weren't technically gifted, but they had a knack of, right, we're not technically great, but we're, we've got the melody. We've got the, the hook, the, something that's catchy that you get to the chorus and 20,000 people know it before uh, it even comes on. And it's just different styles. I that, think it's Oasis just, had it's just, to, it's just a wee different bands. I think up. Oasis had to hang out with if it sounds good in an acoustic guitar, it will sound good everywhere. But it's <coughs> what, you, what you're well, what I'm thinking of saying is a lot of the rough laden music is exactly what it is. It's maybe been bands going in, jamming for half an hour, getting a riff out of you mm-hmm. and then building a song around that. Yeah. But so it's two different ways of approaching writing. But it's also, I remember being like, what, I was a big Metallica fan, and it was almost like they would come up with a song. And it was like the last thing to add to it was lyrics, Aye. but it was simply we need to sing something because it's a song. Aye. But it was like, the whole song was based around the guitar riff, and then the lyrics were almost like an afterthought. Whereas Aye. it was like the, almost flipped, you know. Whereas, as you say, you could just sit with an acoustic, and it might only be three chords, but there's some you come up with a wee catchy uh, vocal melody 
and it just works. And uh-huh. it does work because 20, 20 30 years later, you're, there's still songs that are just as popular as they were back then, if not maybe even more it's popular. It's different ways of approaching songwriting. I know. But um, so, but would you say back when you were a teenager in the 90s, was Oasis your main influence? Or, or was that like. I would say Oasis kick started it. I would say actually, see, supporting. My first two proper concerts I ever went to were Oasis at Ingolston and then Oasis at Lot Well, Island. I was going to ask you what, what professional gigs were you going to back then? So was it or Ah, that was the first Manion. I came in and got to see White Out. When was that? At the Martell. With, with the Oasis one, Oasis sorry. 95. So they're right bang in the. Ah, in 95. It was just when they were... So was that first album? Second album? First album. Because uh, is it the second album that they went massive? Uh, first album. Second album they went... Aye, uh, just through the us. But uh, my first two... But when they set the, the first gig I went to, Ingleson, it wasn't the Oasis. Ocean Carson supported them. Right, okay. And they just got announced as a support band the day before with the Reddit and the Sunday Mail. And were they just up and coming at the time? I hadn't heard of it. In fact, I had heard of them because they'd done a small <coughs> tour up here. So they'd played like... Well, like King Tut's... Can you the Sax and Cumbernauld? No, I don't know that one, but... Sax. So the smaller clubs... Aye, like, maybe that. like 150... Two, aye, like King Tut's. The Leisure Bowl in Alloa, actually. Right, did. OK. Uh, but I had never seen a band. So I had... With the Oasis thing, I had... Liked that kind of music, but it was all basic so it was like g- g- guitar music that i liked mm-hmm. but it was very basic done and then when i seen ocean car scene it was guitar music that i really loved but the the other boys could play Aye. like the, Aye, the, they I, could, I, I hadn't seen anything that i had identified with where the musicians were so is that how is that where you had thoughts of i want a guitar i don't want to just sing i want to i fancy picking the guitar no i never wanted to pick so how, how did you get into playing the guitar what age were you Maybe 16, I think. And how, how did you get your foot? Did you just go and buy it? Did you get it as a present? Or I, got a, I got a shorty one off the woman across the road. Right. Because still in the 90s, you used to get... Can you mind if... Can you mind you used to get the vouchers with the fags? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I used to get the vouchers with the fags. Yeah, yeah. So, for every packet of fags, you would get a wee voucher. It was Ken's at his club. Mm-hmm. And then when you pick, got enough, you could pick something for a catalogue. Aye, okay. And this woman had picked a guitar for a catalogue. Was it acoustic, electric? Acoustic, aye. Aye. It's acoustic. That was my first ever guitar. Strings about like that, aye. off of the neck. Aye, I did to the extent when it was that sore that aye. I tried it for about two weeks and then put it down and then went back to it about six months later. But that was my first, that was my first guitar. It was a woman across the road. Right. And then I bought you in. I th- do you know, I think I more what I needed to play the guitar to... Because I couldn't get... It was for songwriting. I was, was never I, I was was never going to be in songs. I, so see, see as soon as I got capable enough on the guitar to be able to write, to be able to play my songs and write songs, I moved to the keyboard. Right. And then I'd be, I could play all my songs like on the piano, if you know what I mean. I've never ever, I still done it to the day, consider myself a guitarist. No, because I was going to say, are you a rhythm guitarist, are you a lead guitarist, are you, are you a bit of both? R- rhythm's maybe a bit strong, but I, I, if You're not a sort of guitar solo kind of all. guy. No. Never sort of no. learned that I've part only of ever used the guitar as a tool to write songs. That's it. You seem to be doing no too bad with it. Aye, <laughs> But do you know, see my very first band, uh-huh. I wasn't allowed to play the guitar. <laughs> right. I actually wasn't allowed to play it. Right. The guitarist in the band would just be like, no, you're shite. Right. Just put it down. I only, but I could write songs. Aye. But I wasn't allowed to play it live. Was it maybe a wee bit threatened? No, I was shite. Mm. Oh, right, okay. Uh, <laughs> but Stepping on his toes, basically. The thing that got me half decent on the guitar was after my whole kind of original journey had stopped and I started putting the covers in the pubs. But how did you, did you just learn yourself? Did you go to someone for lessons? Did somebody show you the basics? I had an uncle that could play, he showed me a couple of chords, mm-hmm. but what I would do is I would go down and it was very basic, but in fact I had the better reading video. Do you mind the better reading video? No. Everybody had this, like, back in the day, so it was like how to play guitar, right. and, and a day, and a week or whatever. 
So he just go through. This is a G. Where to put your foot? E minor, up. C, D. Those I, are basic chords. And, and then what I would do is see when I could play two or three chords. I would try to write a song. Right. Then what about like see if you've been your learn stuff was it was it music books or by that point had the internet kind of came around? No, nah, no internet. So was it still trying to like find the the, the sheet music, the books that would tell you the chords for the songs and. and or were you? Because I, I I found it not. I found it really difficult when I first learned to play the guitar. I can remember learning and being like, "How does that person like?" I'd maybe have a friend who was like a few years older that'd been playing. I'd be like, seeing the same, they just listen and they just pick it up. I could never understand how how can you just listen and figure it out until the point where I was able to listen and figure it out. Uh, it's what, but it's hard to explain to someone how to do that when you're learning the, the guitar, but then you just figure it out. I, I, had a, I, I would say I've always had a really good understanding about but music. If you're also playing the keyboard, you're maybe, you know, you're, you're hearing the notes. Aye, and you're hearing where changes are yeah. and stuff like that. Yeah. But I, I would... Uh, I, I, you, I still... So I'm self kind of, pretty much self-taught, oh, with a few wee um, hints and tips. I'm 100%. From your uncle. Aye, 100% self-taught. Right, and what about... so? What, what age did you start playing the... So you were obviously playing playing a couple of bands as a teenager and that. I'm assuming they did, nothing really came of, of those ones. Did, did they just sort of fizzle out the way teenage bands do? Oh, no. Uh, the first band, The Circle. Where were they? I we toured Scotland at yeah. when I was 18. And were you playing... Was that originals? Uh, were you a bit of covers or was it just originals? I couldn't play covers until I was about 32. Right. I was just my own songs all the way. Uh, we did. I never played them on the guitar, but we maybe we always used to f like we'd finish later on. We'd finish like with maybe one cover. So just done, for like, a bit of fun. Pinball Wizard was a yeah, bit, yeah, was yeah. a big game we done. But uh, <laughs> it was old school, like going about Scotland in a a van or your couple of cars or something like that, and you load all the gear in. We go squeeze yourself in, and away you go. What happened was we got in with Cumbernauld had a really good scene. When I was about that age, it's one of the, it's one place I've other than going there's a rehearsal place called Paul's Halls. Uh, other than that, I wouldn't have thought there was anything else in Cumbernauld. But back then there was four or five venues and there was four or five brilliant bands and they had a national battle of the bands and we had ended. We done like the usual around here, the Martell. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you would have heard from a previous uh, episode I've done it, it was all about the Martell. But we've done this, it. but anyway, we got to a national finally of Battle of the Bands, and we were only like 18, 19 at the most, our drummer was three years younger than us. Mm -hmm. And then at the time, there was the guy, a guy put a Stone Roses tribute together, and right, okay. old, which was a complete Stone Roses. Right. Which isn't the same complete Stone Roses now, but it it's just different then. guys then. Yeah, yeah. But that guy had to cooperate to the name or whatever. And uh, but back then, but back then they were big, so they were playing like six, seven, eight hundred capacity venues, and decent. even higher because the Stone Roses didn't had split. Yeah, yeah, and they were obviously uh, massive. But and it's no like now where there's like six or seven different Stone Roses tributes, but we mm -hmm. ended up getting them in them. So. At 18, 19, we got to play, so we took Scotland, which was Dumfries, the venues in Oak would have been Strathclyde Uni. In fact, they played Strathclyde Uni before we done this the band called The Circle. Aye. Right. Strathclyde Uni, Liquid Rooms, mm -hmm. which at the time, in fact, we played the Liquid Rooms in Edinburgh. Aye. Yeah. So I think the Liquid Rooms is like six, seven, five, seven hundred folk. Uh, Abbott. The Lemon Tree in Aberdeen, Dundee University. Yep. So, I know, we'd... All the big cities. Aye. So we'd done the, like... We'd done all the venues that weren't quite... The big ones, but they weren't quite as we used. All the five, maybe five, six... Aye, sort capacity. of like the, the next step up from just your bog standard. But I know, we had that... Uh, I had that, like, 18, 19 year old. So we had to get a drummer signed out of school. Right, OK. He had to get signed out of school to go to tour. So what happened... Like you go into your twenties, did, did that just fizzle out? Did, was it? Ah, it just life. Just life gets in the way, kind of thing. So, were you quite? When did you start playing covers in the pubs? Oh, were you quite like late on, like Aye. in your thirties? Aye. Aye. So maybe have you only been doing this maybe 
the, the, the pub cover thing, have you been doing that maybe 10 years? Aye. Right, yeah. and how how did you get into it? Money. So that was, your mo motiv that was your motivation for doing it. But did you, obviously, we've already, you know, we met through, you were coming along, see myself playing, playing gigs. Did you just kind of start learning songs? I and take I, it from there? I stumbled on it. So I had, the, the folk that had the crook, I'm sure it was a crook, James and Lisa, and I'm sh they'd offered me a gig. And at the time, they were like, well, gee, uh, I can't even mind £150 or whatever it what was at the time. Anyway, it hasn't really changed much <laughs> <laughs> since then, if honestly. Aye, but, some of the inflation there. But, uh, right. but they would say that, and at the time, I was like, what covers can I do? So I kind of wrote down, like, what do you know? What could I maybe get away with playing here? Yeah. And I had about 20, I think I kind of mustered up like 25 so it's Is it that same old thing where it's like, because the amount of people I've spoke to, and they, they talk about their first gig, and just playing covers in the pub, and three hours is a long time to play. Aye. Especially if it's just you, you've not got another a band backing you up or four other guys to rely on. I, th I don't think people realise how tough it can be starting out. But a lot of people, they go, I only had an hour and a half, I only had two hours worth. And so you play that, everyone's had a drink by that point, we'll in which case you then just play it again or you pick the best, like the best 15 songs that you've done, you just play them again and nobody really notices. Was it kind of like that? And then, and then you just keep adding and you keep adding and you maybe go to a gig and you see somebody playing a song and you go, that went down really well, I'm going to do that. And, uh, you, and you learn that. And I think there's a wee moment with anybody that plays covers. I mean, I struggled with it at first because I, my background wasn't playing covers. Mm -hmm. Whereas a lot, of, a lot of folk that are playing, they started off with playing covers of their favourite Sometimes songs. they don't progress on from that though. But Sometimes they're quite happy, and there's nothing wrong with that. I know, I totally. They're quite happy just doing covers. Um, I'm probably like you, I, I do it, but I do love the whole creating my own music. Even that, if nobody even hears it. Uh, do you know, no, totally. Uh, it's, uh, and it's about like... It's like a mental uh, thing. Just, do you know, it's just, it's just different backgrounds. It's yeah. different, different backgrounds. My background wasn't a fake covers. Yep. My first songs that I could play on the guitar were my own songs, they weren't the cover songs. But how did you see, go, see going into the pubs? Because I think I was similar to yourself. I always came from, I always played in bands. I always had another three or four guys sort of behind me and I, and I was never the front and centre, I was always like the lead guitar, I was always the one off to the side so you'd have your wee moment to shine and you do your, your guitar solo or that and you'd help write the songs and, and all that but I wasn't the main person so it was a big change even when I was in the pubs doing covers for 10 years Liam, I was jamming with Liam, Liam's obviously front and centre doing the singing I'm playing the lead guitar and it, it's weird because I never realised until I switched position to deciding that it was kind of during lockdown, I think, you know, I'm going to learn to do the rhythm guitar and I, I'd never sang in front of anybody other than doing backing vocals, which is a, a whole other game. But uh, see, once I started doing it, I was like, no, I, I think I can do this. But it was funny, I used to like, me and Liam would do a three hour gig and at the end of it, like Liam's drenched in sweat, sweat's pouring off him and and I'm like, no too bad. And then seeing I switched around and it's the same thing. I don't see plate singing and playing rhythm for three hours. Uh, that it's a huge difference between doing that and playing a lead guitar and, and just accompanying someone and hopefully make, doing what, whatever they're playing, you making it sound a that little bit better. But it, it, I mean it's I still enjoy doing it, but it's very, very different. But um Obviously, like switching and saying, right, I'm going to learn to do the rhythm now because I, I was a lead guitarist, I wasn't a rhythm guitarist, and I did singing, but it was always recording, so it was in the sort of privacy of my man cave or whatever. And, you know, I wasn't like one for doing it in front of people. I even felt awkward doing the backing singing with Liam, even though I kind of got used to it. But in hindsight, I go, right, those 10 years of playing gigs, doing backing singing, and that probably helped prepare me for when I actually then decided to do it solo because very quickly I then was like I can do this I, I, you know I don't think I'm any better than anybody else but I, I don't think I'm any worse either yeah. you know and it, it was good it was just a matter of trying it as like the biggest hurdle for me was 
the songs, trying to get enough songs because as you say, it's three hours of playing is a lot of songs. And then it's that thing, you don't want to just play, you want to be able to, you don't want to play the same songs every gig, you want to be able to do a request, but that's something that just comes in time, you build up the songs that you're able to do, you know which ones work, you know which ones don't work, you know that, right, I'm going to learn these five songs because they're a wee bit of a, a filler, I don't want to just be hit, you know, one after the other, you want to kind of have a couple that are placed there, you might even throw in a couple that you know are not popular but it's just a wee bit of fun, I'll throw in one that's not that popular but I'm going to play it anyway, but how did you feel when you started doing your actual acoustic gigs, like doing the covers, was I, it sort of similar? Do you know what, I think I was just the same and I think everybody would have been the same, well I'd imagine they would have been at first, you're at that thing where I can't believe I'm getting paid to just play my guitar for a few hours. That's it. Do you know what I mean? And then you put it in the context about what you were getting paid at your day job and what you were getting paid. Are you going to do overtime in the office? You're going to have to do a lot more hours than three hours to be making the same money. So for that that point of view, I think that was that. I think we all got that. Were you nervous with regard to having to maybe like talk to the the audience? Well, it's funny you say that because see my first band I was in, Mm -hmm. I didn't speak. Well, the guitarist of the talking. I've never been comfortable talking in a microphone. I'm already singing it, singing into it, yeah. but the actual talking part. Not even just the sort of. Yeah. Not even to introduce a song, no? No, never been comfortable with it. I'm not I'm no as bad now. I'm alright now with it. I'm alright now with it, but I, I've never been. You know yourself, it depends on what you've got there as an audience. The type of, pub, the type of audience that you've got in, how so, you're maybe feeling on the night. You know, it might even come down to I've got a great, great sound, or you know, I'm sounding crap tonight. My guitar's no sounding quite good. My PA sounds a bit exactly uh, whatever. There's a lot of things that can affect your actual mood of the gig. Uh, so many times I play a gig, and I come away from it thinking, oh, didn't they sound that good? But I'll have pals that were there, and they're like, that sounded fine. It didn't sound any different from last week when you played, and you, you thought you sounded really good. Sometimes it's just a bit of a mental thing. Oh, totally. And, it's, it's like a, and there's so many factors that can affect how you feel. It's like it's, it's like any other. It's like it's such a, see at the end of the day, see when it becomes you're getting paid for it. It's such a, it turns into a job. Aye. And anybody, no, everybody goes to their job every day feeling amazing. Feeling amazing. I all gone through that day. Amazing. We all hear the well. Even anybody, even in a ninety-five, yeah. will be at some point. I'll just be like. Thank fuck that day's over, do you know what I mean? Or, yeah. uh, do you, do you, obviously you do, you do um, plenty of gigs, do you, do you like, um, what, is, do you like the gigs most of the time, or, or is there a, obviously we, we all do gigs that are great, what is it you like about gigs, is it, and what is it you don't like about gigs? I still love, there's no better buzz, covers or original, when you've got a pub, and then you just get the pub in the pub, and you've your just, you've, 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 you've just got to like that. It's amazing how e- you can play a song, and if you've got the right crowd, it's so easy. You do it the, the same song somewhere where it's you've uh, not got the right crowd, and it's like pulling teeth sometimes. Oh, hundred percent. But the, my, the only difficult part I've got it is if it's if the pub's too busy, and it's dead. Because I very much I'm a I've, I've never heart. wrote set no well I've never wrote set lists mm-hmm. I've wrote lists of songs that but you I, can play. I have never went right that's my first set that's my second set I very much feed off crowd reaction right. so if you've not got a crowd there and you've not got a reaction yeah you know, I'm it can be a I'm long, a, I'm a, long, long three hours I'm a wee bit like right. do you know what I mean because you kind of get right I've got I like that one so this is pretty similar or. Or like I played a gig the other day there and I realised that he'd lifted a bit. Mm-hmm. So I'd played something there uplifting. But you've always got about certain five songs that you know if you're needing a song like that, if you play one of these five songs, you know it's just going to... There's certain songs, for whatever reason, they just go down great. And it's amazing. See, many times I'm, I'm trying to find new songs to keep it a bit interesting for myself. But see, many times you go, that is a great tune. And you play it, and it's just mm, no. for whatever reason it just doesn't uh, work, or you know, it, it, people know the song, but it just doesn't work. It doesn't go across great. Maybe you need to practice, 
practice it a wee bit more. See how many times you, you'll play a song that, in my mind, it's a filler. It's just a song to play for the next five minutes, and it goes to like folk are like loving it. But you can't always guess what what the songs are going to be. It's just like what you said about uh, the musicians playing, though. It's like there'll be days where it's maybe not quite happening, but it's the same when you're going into a pub or a venue that you'll be saying. You don't know what kind of day the people that are in there have had. You don't know what kind of what people are. I mean, there's been many a gig I've played where people have maybe come up and asked me for something or loved a song I've played that I would yep. never have thought looking at them. That and they would have been interested. Yeah, they'd, they'd have been into that. But I'm also I also saying that maybe struggle sometimes when the gigs are quiet. But I've also had brilliant gigs where it's just been like maybe just fifteen, twenty folk. Because sometimes mm-hmm. when a pub's too busy, you have no go to that engagement. Well, it, so- it sounds weird, but see many times, I, I was trying to explain, m- my dad was asking about about gigs last year, and I, he thought it was weird of me to say this, but see many times, it, it can be too busy. Like, like you, you, you would think the busier the better, but it's like, no, it can, it, definitely when it's quiet, it, it can be a bit of soul destroying. But it can be too busy that uh-huh. you're just like, get me, let's hurry up and finish this and get me home. You just want that sort of nice in between bit. But see if you could just get that every gig, it'd be amazing. But I do take my hat off to anyone that goes to a pub and plays it because see, driving to a pub, you're stone cold sober, right? So you've not got any like um, alcohol to get your courage up a wee bit. To walk into a pub, and you are the centre of attention. But you don't know anybody. You don't know anybody. You're the centre of attention. You're the noisiest person in the pub because you've got a PA system set up behind you and um, and it's your job to entertain these strangers. But that's difficult to do. And I, th- I think a lot of people, it's a wee bit like um, if you're good at something, you make it look easy. Definitely. And I think you've got to also look, you, know, you sometimes just need to take a step back and go, you're in a very fortunate position to be able to make their money, no, that's like life-changing money, but it's still just people out there that would bite your hand off but it's to not- be able to go out and make the money that you can make. Yeah. So sometimes I kind of feel myself like maybe you can come back for a gig and like maybe a wee bit dude in the dumps because maybe they're not waiting great. Yeah. But then you've also still got to you think, it's not been a great night for that wee bar lassie either, or bar aye, guy either, aye. that's on minimum wage. Aye. Do you know what of I mean? Course. And aye. it's... Aye. Um, so, see, separate from the gigs, I know that you write your own your own tunes, right? How do you... What, what's your method for writing? Like, do, do you... Is it the same most of the time as in... For myself, see how many times I'm listening to a song could be any song, could be on the radio, could be a band that I like that have put their CD in or that. And see the amount of times where it'll just, it could just be one line of lyrics or just like something, a wee bit of melody or so, something just, it, it catches my attention. And I, and I can write an entire song from that, nothing at all to do with the song that inspired it, you know, lyrics or music wise, but the amount of times that happens, but I'm, I'm generally like, I'll be, it'll be like the guitar first, and I'll probably maybe hum like a sort of a, a vocal melody, but the words always come last for me. And then I, I kind of like start on the guitar, and then, and then if it's if it's the, the band thing, I'll kind of layer it up. And um, you know, or I can see the, I can imagine the drums kind of doing this sort of thing, or maybe the bass doing that, or the guitar solo. But it's always sort of chords first, with a vocal melody in my my head, but the words always come last. How, how do you go about writing a song? Predominantly, I know it'll be the will be the instances. No, no, where it's different. Is, aye, but uh, predominantly, is it similar? Guitar. No, I don't think, I think because I think you've got more at your disposal than me, so you're already thinking of the bigger picture for mm-hmm. the off, because you can record for the off, right. whereas I would have the nucleus of uh, the song done just on an acoustic guitar, mm-hmm. and 
75% lyrics done. I never ever fully write a lyric until it's getting recorded. I never ever completely finish it, but I've usually got at least the hook line or the mail or the may, the chorus or something. I've got the gist of it or I've got what it's going to sound like. See with your lyrics as well. Do your lyrics make sense to you? As in, are, are you, when you're writing the song, are you thinking, I know what this is about? And, and then you'd write the story sometimes and, and is it sometimes it's just the words come out you're not quite sure what they mean and it's kind of amazing because years later you can go back and look at it and you can go it could have meant this it could have meant that i suppose it's different to each person that listens to it aye 100 percent. because I, I feel like my lyrics are there is a couple of songs i've got where it's about a specific subject and i go i i know this line relates to this or it means this but there's a lot of mine where I'm like, I'm not 100% sure what it's actually about. Aye, 100%. And I think in either, there's times where before the finished thing's done, mm -hmm. I've maybe got to throw a few words in or move a few things about to make it make sense to me. Yeah. If you know what I mean. The but a lot of stuff, a lot of the stuff I've got, I would say I have just... Do you know what? I always find maybe like my first verse, my chorus, and the first bridge or whatever it is, it's always maybe when it comes to like, fuck, I need to make this a wee bit longer here. A bridge section or Aye, something well, different at the end. I recorded or... one this year uh, where, the, where the full song was done, but I got to a middle eight and I had the middle eight and I didn't know quite what to do with this middle eight. Yep. And I tried a few things, but it took, because the guy, the Martin Malady who I'm recording with, mm -hmm. It's been like eight months, it might even have been longer than that, between the first tape, because we knew it wasn't there, right, we knew it was the middle eight. Mm -hmm. It took about eight months to get going, that's what needs to happen. So, so do you do you enjoy recording? Because mm -hmm. I, I know Now I do, I didn't used to. There's some people that they're like, I really don't like recording, but I'll go in and do it because that then allows me to then play the songs live. I enjoy recording if somebody else is doing the recording. Where is it? I really love the, the creating process. Try, uh, trying this, trying that. I, I love seeing something built from scratch. You know, we I've maybe got a wee recording on my phone of me doing this. Well, I've got a wee sort of verse chorus idea, and, and then you see it progress right through to the end product. I, I, I like, I like that. But I know there's some people that they do it purely because they need the song recorded in order to play it live. I think the thing, I think the thing is, is like, there's, there's like a 10 year gap. I done a demo, maybe about five years ago, which was kind of like the stepping stone to stuff I've no longer recorded there. Was that the one you, you gave us? Aye. Uh, yeah. So I done that just for my own pleasure. Mm -hmm. But uh, there's been like a 10, in fact, maybe longer than that, like a 12 year gap between the Sherman's last recording and what I've been doing now. And the difference in how you record has evolved so much since then. Mm -hmm. So when I was in the bands, it was pretty much you rehearsed your ass off until you got the songs right. You go in, you would record it as you rehearsed them, and you'd maybe put a guitar over the band and a backing vocal. But it's and that would be live though. That would be aye, but that mm -hmm. would be the only things on top here. Whereas now, and you'll have done it yourself, you can record and record it's and all, still, it's not, you could keep going to it. I find, it depends maybe on everyone's personality is different. I think sometimes if you're a perfectionist though, it can be a hindrance because you could spend forever. 100%. You know, whereas there's, there's something nice about, see if you're, when we were younger, for example, you would rehearse, 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 because you had to have it right, because when you are paying for studio time, you had to have, know your stuff inside out, and you didn't have time to try this and to try that, you had to have it sorted before you went in, as you say, you could maybe fix a couple of mistakes, or add a couple of guitars here and there, but it was that thing where, if you're, if you're paying for 10 hours of studio time, you need to make sure you know what you're doing, whereas, if you've got your own recording stuff at home, you could spend a hundred hours and you're still messing about with stuff, almost even, to the point that you're like, is it even improving the song? I don't even think it's perfectionism. I think it's just that it's that much you can do now. Mm -hmm. I don't even think it means that you're a perfectionist, but I just think 
you can't leave it alone. It's not the day with perfection. It's just the day with. You think you have so much that you. Whereas before, I mean, I I'm going when I first, when I was first recording, it was only like one of the four track task cards. Ta yeah, I had one as well. So yep. you only had the four options unless you started. But it's interesting it. what you can try and do when you're limited. So you're actually more creative that way sometimes. Yeah. Whereas now, now you could have endless amounts of tracks. You could have like a hundred tracks. Aye. If you wanted. Well, what I've I've got like. Do you find it hard to finish a song? To go, the song is complete, it's finished. We don't need to add anything more to it. Nah, because I've only really. Well, you pretty much like, I know kind of what I want with this song, and, and I know when it's like that's it done. Let's move on to the next one. Aye, pretty much. So, see the songs that you've sent me quite a few songs in, uh, over the last year. Is that just solo stuff that you'd work on, or is that a band? I'm not sure yet. So it's been recorded solo. So it's been recording just me and or it's pretend it's ideas that, that you wanted recorded properly, but you're not sure what you're going to Aye. use them for going forward. Aye. Because they've been sounding good. Uh, I, I let Alison hear them. I think you'd sent me over four or five Aye. tracks, and uh, I kind of went back with what I thought sound wise and everything. So sounding really good. But before we finish up, I took notes. On the Shermans, right? So, because I, I, I don't know anything about the Shermans, so you can tell me if any of this is, is wrong, right? So, most of it's Wikipedia, right? So, it's formed 2006 to 2010, uh, roughly, 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 four years, right? It was a 2005 so, demo, right? Five members, right? It was it yourself, vocals only? Is it just you singing? Because uh, uh, I've got down here, there's, there's Graham Middleton, so what's he playing? He was like guitar. Lead guitar, Nick Cheatham. There's rhythm guitar. Rhythm guitar. So that's your two guitarists. Kenny McDonald. Bass. Bass. And Dave Cumming, drums. drums. So there's a five year, right? Well, it was Chris Kerr, though. Chris was actually the original rhythm guitarist before Nick. Right, okay. So, so and then Graham now stays in Sweden and Chris came back as a lead guitarist. So see, when you got together, who was right? Was, writing the songs, were you getting together as a band in a rehearsal and it just came about or or were you writing something and then already coming with a song kind of complete? No, uh, no, it's a hundred. Is it just a joint effort? No, it was all my song, it was all me. So you're writing the tunes, uh, come in and uh, everybody then contributes, adds a wee bits to it just to help. The, sh the, sh the Sherman's was only meant to be a joke. Right, that's probably stylistic quite a few folk, but it was only, it was only initially meant to be a joke. Right, okay. But what happened with the Shermans was I'd just split up. I just finished with the circle, that right. band. I was a manager in the Summerfield in Bridge Island at the time. Mm -hmm. And I got fed up because we took ourselves, we ended up taking ourselves too seriously with the circle. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to start starting me a ba spa band, it was just a bit, a bit of fun. fun. So at the time I had Kenny, like, can you play any? And I was like, do you want to be in a band? He was like, can I play? And I was like, but he was into music. Right. I was like, well I can show you how, like, enough to be, get by on the bass. Yeah, of course. Uh, I had Graham, mm -hmm. that was a keyboard player. I was like, do you want to be in a band? He was like, I but I want to play the guitar. <laughs> so he ended up being a lead guitarist. Which they make it difficult for yourself? Guitarist. Didn't he know chords? Right, okay. Or that. And then, Chris was near in the fold at this point, and then had, I was, I was recruiting. And I then had four application forms, and I gave, and then I done that. I did done the interviews, and one of the interviews was Dave, whose hobbies were listed as drumming. Ah, right, okay. And I was like, I'll give you a job if you drum in this band. There you go, then, eh? <laughs> so I ended up a complete. So the first couple of practices, you can imagine, were fucking shambolic. Aye. and it's the same with most bands. Uh, yeah. But Graham, Graham being a keyboard player playing the lead guitar worked really well because he didn't really, he didn't play the chords with other rhythm. He just focused he, on the lead part. Aye, he just played the lead. And, and in me solos just played the lead a bit. But what you find though is he, he probably, maybe not even on purpose, creates a different sound. He did. Because he did. you get a lot of bands where it's, when the lead guitarist isn't doing the solo, he's just copying what the rhythm guitarist is doing. Aye. That's like, like, when myself and Liam used to play gigs, people used to re come up to us afterwards, especially other musicians, and they, they would talk about how they, they liked what we're playing. Because see the amount of times I would see see two guys playing in the pubs, and 
they would both play the same thing. So they're both uh, playing rhythm. And I'm like, it's just overkill. Like, why are you playing rhythm if this guy's already playing rhythm and singing? Whereas what I used to do was I would always try and play lead. So even when it was a rhythm part, I would play it different from what Leo, how Liam was playing it. So I'd maybe pick... Yeah, or even if it was two notes. Pick the chords or I'd maybe do a wee counter melody that just fitted and then you'd have your guitar solo bit, but it, it built a different sound. And that's kind of, it's almost similar to what you're saying with the Sherman. I know, definitely. With the I two mean, guitarists. What happened with us was, because he has lack of ability on the guitar and Kenny's lack of ability on the bass, what it done was it let the song breathe. And, and what it, happens with a lot of bands, and you'll have been in the band yourself, yep. where, and there was bands about that time, there was some cracking bands about the time we were about, but there was also bands where they were fortunate or unfortunate enough that every single one of them was brilliant. Yeah. And what ended up happening was it was just overload. It was too yeah. much because well, the drummer was amazing, the bass player was amazing, the guitarist was amazing, whereas with yeah. us, we didn't have that problem. Well, that's the other thing I, I'd found when people used to speak to us about the setup that myself and Liam had was the reason that I think it worked so well was we both knew our place. Aye. Right? Liam was there, main guy, playing rhythm and singing. I was there adding lead guitar and hopefully making whatever Liam was doing sound that bit better. But it, it wasn't this fight for the spotlight. Whereas what you find in a lot of bands, especially when you've got a lot of talented people, is it's like everybody's fighting for the spotlight rather than contributing their own wee part to make the overall sound sound better. 100%. And uh, there's so many bands, I mean, musician-wise, they're brilliant, but everybody's fighting for this spotlight. And uh, it's like if they were to take a step back and go, let's just play what we need to play for the greater good, it can actually. No, totally. Better. But what what I'm saying coming from me is we didn't even have that option. Yeah. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Because, but it worked for us. It sounds like they maybe unknowingly ended up approaching each of them ended up approaching their instrument different from the norm because of maybe a lack of ability or. But it I know it was. had a good result though. I know it was. It was. We played to the song. The song was the key. I mean, I used to. Used and if you're already coming with the song, you know, the basic song already, this is kind of what I want it to sound like, and then they start adding other bits, it's actually. You can see why it would have a, a unique sound to it. See, what you're saying there about. What you were saying about a couple of months ago regarding how we used to record where you'd have. You were spending money on the recording, you needed to get in, you needed to make sure everything was all right. Yeah. I was also like that with rehearsing. So I hate, I didn't, I, I've never, I've always hated jamming. I don't like jamming. Mm -hmm. I've got to know what I'm going to be playing. Yeah. Uh, so I was always, I'd at least have 90% of a song sorted because I, ref, even though it was only like Just wasting, wasting time. Wasting time. And I wasn't going to go into a studio for an hour, mm. muck about for an hour to hopefully come up with something and nip it for a fag. So what we would do is we would work on a nearly finished song mm -hmm. to get it like we uh, to get it done. Right. Uh, I never went into a studio <laughs> and just said, "Oh, let's see what's going to happen tonight, guys. Let's just." Uh, okay, if you've got any, a bottomless pit of money. Um, it was also. I suppose it's also all right and all if you're. If that might also be the case where if the musicians are technically. Ken, you have got a guitarist that's going to come up with. Uh, you know if you're saying, right, this is the chords, that they're all going to be exceptionally great that they can figure it out. But, but by the time the band, the Shermans came about, I'd already been in a band that had done 100 plus gigs. Mm -hmm. So I'd kind of, in that time, learnt a lot of... So you're the, definitely the most experienced of the five band members. Aye, the other boys hadn't With regard to gigging and all that sort of stuff as well. Aye. Right, so it's got here that you assigned to Platform Records, which I've looked up, it's still on the go. Aye. Right, uh, and your debut single, Calling It Wrong, was released 21st of April 2007. UK Indie Charts, it got to 20, and the Scottish Charts, it got to 23. So that's obviously your song. The, the, well, you wrote it, it's the Sherman song, eh? Uh, your second single, Venom, was released 13th of April 2009. So you took two years to write a new song. 
No, it didn't take two <laughs> years to enter. Them, it took two years to save the money up to be yeah, able to go yeah. back and record it. Done better though, UK ND chart, you got to number 10. Scottish chart, you got to number 7. It then says that he's went on a break. 27th of January 2010, so the next again year. So it sounded like you were building all this momentum. How? What, what was the reason for the break? Or was it similar to before that life kind of just got in the way? No, no, at all. We never fell out of it. Do you know what? We mm-hmm. played Stirling Castle. So... <sighs> we had a lot of big gigs. We, we played a lot of big gigs. We did a lot of big gigs. And to me, it just had kind of... Did you just feel like it wasn't getting to the next? Aye. If it was going to get there, it would have already happened. It was, aye. I'd kind of resigned to myself in the fact that, um, you know what, this isn't going to happen. Mm. They ended up going to Stirling Castle. See, here's a question for you, right? So that's 2010 that he's kind of took a break, right? See if it had been 15 years before. Do you think it would have been different? Because the music industry has changed massively. So see everything you were doing. See if you if you were doing it in 1995, do you think it would have been the same end result? No. No? No. We had, we were actually, we had a point where it was, we were taken out in Glasgow by a thing affiliated with Sony BMG and a big, uh, and it was big management. Mm -hmm. Came through a air rehearsal room and speeches to that, all the rest of that. And then the third thing was, we had basically like a kind of showcase thing at the FUBA and all our gigs in the FUBA had been previously bouncing and this night we never saw it, it wasn't, it wasn't that busy and we knew that there was folk coming to watch us and right. it just kind of froze. Nah, we never, see if, see if a, a management company or a record company are going to sign a band, mm-hmm. they've not got time to work about it. They want, a, yeah. so they want a look, so they want to be, so the songs, the boys said the songs were there but we weren't the quite... just something missing. Aye, it was something missing. And something they wanted, but aye. they just didn't And that, that something missing would have still been missing back then. You know, it's amazing though, I remember watching um, a documentary on The Doors, and they, long before the whiskey and all that, when they were first starting out, they were playing, they were playing it somewhere just down the road from it, and they'd convinced, some, somehow they managed to convince a record person to come along, and... Um, and they done, I think they done two 45 minute sets. So they'd done the first, the first set and said place was empty and it was, they just weren't clicking. For whatever reason, it just wasn't happening on stage. But they managed to convince them to stay around for the next set. And he says the next set, they blew him off. It blew his mind. They were like, absolutely amazing. And uh, it's just... I don't know, sure I don't know, but it's, 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 I love hearing stories like that where you're just I, thinking, nah. if that guy had just turned and walked, rather than just stay an extra 50 minutes and watch them for the same but, but then, I'm it's just, amazing, but then there's part, also as well, it's a different time, I and then as no, no, all, Spotify had just started, so we wouldn't really got that, social media wasn't what it is now, so, you see hundred. to be honest with you, see you getting signed to a major label, I've just seen it in the last year with a couple of bands uh, where, well, the Snuts, for example, that blew up. Yeah. They've just went, they've just uh, came away from the record label, doing everything themselves. Because mm-hmm. the record label's no got the same. What you it, do, do, it doesn't mean, I think, what it used to be. Used mean. To I don't mean that in a bad way because it must be great to get signed, but. It does mean something different now to 20 years You're ago. Sure you can be so much self-sufficient now. Because I, I, I've got a friend who's playing in the band and they're doing pretty well, getting some good gigs, getting some good support slots for well-known um, big name bands. But they're all still working their day job, doing this and that. Now, if it had been 25 years ago, they would have maybe got an opportunity where it was like, right, we're going to sign you and maybe you can, we'll sign you for an album, for two albums or something, and you can focus on the music. Um, but they don't seem to get that push now. And it's a shame because they're, they're really good, but they're just, it feels like they're kind of stuck, like they can't get to the next level. I think and, fi- and a part of that is the, I think the record label is just so different now to what it was 25 years it's ago. A, it's, it's a, See, see I, think, I think the last 
I listened to a podcast recently and it was a guy that was at Andy McDonald, I think it was Godisks he had, which was Paul Weller. Yep. And then you had Alan McGee with Oasis, obviously. That was people that had record labels because they loved music. Yeah. Whereas now... They weren't a the businessman, they I, loved music. No, business a, came second. I knew it's a business. Who was I listening to recently? And he says that they got ten in. And they're getting tell basically they're getting tell us somebody in a suit that's came out of university with nothing to do with music. Mm -hmm. Telling them what they need to do. That, so This is what's popular. There's, this the is song, what's the popular. songwriter podcast I listen to, but I can't even tell it was Robin Hinchcliffe or something, maybe I can't anyway, somebody that's heard records now out and he's now just a songwriter. Mm -hmm. But they actually get like a remit for record companies now and it is based on like averages of what, uh, what, how the tar charts have trended. Mm -hmm. So they'll say, right, we need a song that has got three syllables in the chorus that has 130 BPM. Right, it's it so, doesn't it's go uh, such a, a certain length, you know, even a certain key. Or that you've not got that creative freedom anywhere. And there is a lot of bands that do have it, but you probably don't have the backing of a. You know, there's plenty of good bands out there doing their, their thing and they sound amazing. Uh, but have you, has a, there's a lot of people who've never heard of them. That's you know, it. Depends what you're after. But see, with regard to the Shermans, so 14 years later, I bought a couple of tickets a couple of weeks ago. You are doing a gig Friday the 19th of April 2024 at McHugh's in Bannockburn. Mm. Um, I don't want to say reform because he's never really split up. It was a, a bit of a sort of break, but is it the same guys? Apart from Graham, because he's in Sweden. And who, who, so who's replaced Graham on the guitar? Chris. Who was the original rhythm guitarist? And was there a, re a certain reason why you are like, let's do a gig now? Do you pl is it a one off? Do you plan on hopefully doing more after that? No, it's a one off. Is it just you are all in the same place at the same time? Let's get together and just do a gig for for the fun. We actually had one. We were meant to do one. I think it was like the first week we went into lockdown. The first lockdown. All oh, right, okay. So we had that was that balls that were not for a few years. So we had that announced then. So we're going to do it for then. But I is purely so a are you, pleasure. Are you just meeting up now and practicing? We've no yet. We start on we start this coming Monday. So we've just secured a room mm -hmm. uh, premises and. That's, so I've got her own room now, so... How's your ticket sales, have they been okay? Ticket sales have been brilliant. Yeah. So what we've done was, I think we released them like the Christmas week, which would maybe be a bit silly, but we did. But we're... 70% there. Yep. So... Just needs to take a few more Christmas, advertisements on the so social I, media. So I says to the boys, let's leave it, get Christmas out of the way first and then we'll... So, really? so it should be sold at the end of January. That's uh, good. And you're looking forward to... I'll see how Monday goes. I'll be fine. I've not played it. I've not played the email. No, but it's nothing more. The new anyway. I mean, there's obviously like. I know you just. Sorry, are you going to just be able to be your old set list like all the songs that you've done previously? It's not like you are going in and writing new stuff. If we play anything new, I'll be like something that two you're songs that we come up with already. Two songs that I mean, it's just so folk can grab a right. push for the bar. Uh, but <laughs> if it's. Uh, Aye, or it'll, it'll be the songs I've recorded. Right, I might okay. just use that, depending on what I'm going to do with these new songs. Um, I might just if use it's it. something that's simple enough that the guys can pick it up quite quickly and see how it's going. But I mean, you, you'll have enough, enough songs that you can get your set list together. And Aye, well, have any of you, what? Why even McHugh's? Is there because any I've, never, I've be never been to any Because the capacity we get for it. Yep. Which is basically nearly 250. Yep. Uh, again, and I sound like yeah, it's really central for everyone. Money. Aye. Because, to, unbelievably, in Stirling, it is so difficult to get a venue where what happens in the queues is we get their hall. Uh, we've had great nights over the years. It used to be, it used to be great for bad nights anyway. Right. But they've always been good for the venue point of view. Where there's not, I'm not going to name venues or whatever, but you're actually having to pay them to fill their pub or fill right, okay. Whereas especially it's in paid to play almost. Ah, so especially in Stirling, mm -hmm. it's like uh, it's almost there's, like there's council-run venues mm -hmm. where you've got to pay X amount of money 
before you've even stepped in it. Whereas with McHugh's... It's the same through in Glasgow. Whereas McHugh's, we pay our sound guy and everything else is in. Right. That is for us. Whereas, for, I, it's also keys at that wee king day. It's a lot more intimate. Yep. Because the folk are right there and, they, and it's not like you're up here and you're down there. But I, it is quite difficult, mm -hmm. believe it or not, to put something on Stirling where you're not having to... It's the same in Glasgow as well, spend though. Spend money. Yeah. That's good, though. And uh, last question for you, right? You always hear it in different podcasts. Mount Rushmore, who would be your top four either bands or musicians that, that you just think these these are just perfect either whether it be as a songwriting as just a band you know performing who are your four top ones that you just like I've had to see one other than really, myself I've not really got four I really haven't just one just me because <laughs> because as I, I've never been can I say yourself <laughs> I've never been in uh, like I've never maybe had like eight albums for the same band Right. I've always skimmed, I've always been very much a kind of greatest hits. Is there no any songwriters who are just like, I just love their stuff? Oh, do maybe Crowded House actually, Neil Finn. Yeah. Crowded House, uh, any Any of the buddy that, would, that I wouldn't expect? Mm. You, you got any, any like, um, like obviously you're, uh, you're into rock, what about like, sort of like a Nick Drake? Maybe Jim Lee, right. actually Slade. Yep. Uh, from a songwriting point of view. What about performance wise, is there any bands you're just like, you know, maybe in their prime they were just untouchable? Yeah, I'd love to have seen The Clash. Yeah. Well, I'd love to have seen The Clash. I've seen, it, I've seen, Joe, I've seen Joe Strummer. Is that, the, is that the, like, the, the old the question, if there's any band you could have seen? Aye, probably. Just for the, what it looks like. I just think wise. Queen in their prime would have just been outstanding. Oh, no, the Clash for me. I was lucky enough to see Joe Strummer. Before he died at Tina Park, right, and he played three or four class songs, but uh, I maybe that. But I think modern day, I don't think there's anything that I've I'd want to see that I've no seen. But I, I, I couldn't really say like for, I, I'm very, it's very mixed. I go for like pop, pop. Aye, to, to you're like, all you're all over the place. Aye, but Shawnee, you were worried that we weren't going to have anything to talk about, and that's it done. So thanks for coming over. Until next time. Cheers.